Welcome to this evening's panel. My name is Zach Karanovich. I am the Graduate Research Assistant at the Boise Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. I want to take care of a few housekeeping uh, uh, issues, if you don't mind, before we begin. First, we ask that you please turn off your cell phone ringers. Even if you think you have, maybe check one more time. Secondly, seating, as you can see, is sort of interesting in this room. There's no center aisle, and access in and out of this side is uh, a little bit uh, obstructing of the panel. So if you have any space, I don't see many, if any, uh, more seats in the middle. If you could shift to my left, that would be, uh, that would be a great thing to do so that any last minute folks can join us on that side and not have to walk across the panel, um, if you don't mind. Just for your information, this evening's panel and the question and answers that will follow will be recorded and posted online, accessible through our website, bc.edu slash quasi. And finally, after the panel this evening, an assortment, a small assortment of the many books that are published by our uh, distinguished panel will be available for sale in the hallway. I'm going to interrupt you. We're Monica and um, come on up. The Vanna Whites. I asked them to be the Vanna Whites here. Uh, I, want to, I want to show you the, the if you want to sign, film fast to be the one to sign. You just walk in, don't walk in front. Let me do the whole thing. That's the humiliation for this. We also want to draw your attention just to just a few of the upcoming events this fall. On Friday, October the 4th, at the Boise Center from 12 to 1.15 p.m., we will host a luncheon colloquium featuring Michael Serrazio, who will discuss his research in a talk entitled The Power of Sports, Media and Spectacle in American Culture. Uh, the following Monday, October the 7th, at the same place, the Boise Center, and at the same time, 12 to 1.15, our second luncheon colloquium of the semester, featuring R. Ward Holder and Peter Josephson, will speak in a talk entitled Religion and the Divided American Republic, Rawls' Fault. So come find out how that question is answered. Don't blame Rawls, but come anyways. <laughs> Both of those events require an RSVP, which can be done on our website. And then finally, on Wednesday, October the 9th, from 5.30 to 7, the Boise Center will hold the third annual Wolf Lecture on Religion and American Politics featuring Sarah Stitzline from the University of Cincinnati with Christopher Higgins responding from here at Boston, at Boston College on the topic of her book, Reviving Democracy During the 2020 Campaign Season by Learning How to Hope. For further information on these and all of our events, please check our website, bc.edu slash Boise. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the director of the Boise Center and this evening's moderator, Mark Massa of the Society of Jesus. Welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to see you here. I think I can promise uh, a lively conversation. I ask that nobody throw anything unless it's a rosary. <laughs> so let me introduce uh, our distinguished panelists. On the far end of this row, uh, Professor Richard Gillardi is the Joseph Professor of Systematic Theology here at BC. And he is currently the chair of the theology department in which I am. He has published numerous articles and authored or edited 14 books. He does not sleep. <laughs> Most recently, he published a new and revised and expanded edition of his popular work, By What Authority? Foundations for Understanding Authority in the Church, published last year by Liturgical Press. To his left is Professor Natalia Imperatori Lee, whom I taught as an undergraduate, but I was 10. Professor Imperatori Lee is a professor of religious studies at Manhattan College where she also coordinates the Catholic Studies program. She is the author of Quentame, I said Quentame, Narrative and in the Ecclesial Present. Her work focuses on the intersection of Latinx theologies, feminist theologies, and Catholic ecclesiology. To her left is Bishop Mark O'Connell, who is the regional bishop for the northern region of the Archdiocese of Austin, which includes 60 parishes, and he is himself the pastor of St. Teresa's Parish in North Reading, Massachusetts. He graduated from BC here in 1986 and from St. John's Seminary in 1990. He studied in Rome and obtained a doctorate in canon law for the Pontifical College 
of the Holy Cross in 2002. And finally, to my immediate right is Professor Phyllis Logano, who is a senior research associate in residence in the Department of Religion at Hofstra University. She's a Catholic scholar who lectures on contemporary spirituality and women's issues in the church. Her award-winning books include Holy Saturday, An Argument for the Restoration of the Female Diaconate in the Catholic Church, Women in Catholicism, Gender, Communion, and Authority, and Women, Deacons, Question Mark, Essays with the Answer. She was also recently a member of the Papal Commission for the Study of Women and the Diaconate, established by Pope Francis in 2016. Please join me in welcoming you. First, like rules for the road. Um, I, we're gonna, I'm going to begin the conversation this afternoon with two sets of questions for the panelists here. And once they've gone through those two sets of questions, we will open up the conversation to all of you. So you will have a chance to be in conversation with all of them. So the first set of questions, which I've asked our distinguished guests to address is, I want them to spend up to four minutes on what they think the single most important issue that needs to be addressed to reform the current structure of the Catholic Church. This is essentially an institutional question, but it can certainly also be a theological one and a pastoral one. So we'll begin with Professor Zagana. Um, the last time I saw the Holy Father in Casa Santa Marta, I said, you know, he always says, oh, would you pray for me? So before he did, I said, Father, I pray for you all the time. And I pray for women deacons. <laughs> and he said, to proclaim the gospel. <laughs> so that's what it's about. <laughs> I tend to think it's a fairly good idea. Uh, but it's not my idea. And, and I'll speak a little bit about others who have suggested that this uh, could be a way of bringing, uh, bringing the church back to its uh, history. Um, you know, whose idea is it anyway? Uh, after Vatican II, Pope Paul VI asked Cyprian Baggini, a liturgical scholar, uh, about women deacons. And, and Baggini said, yes, they were ordained. It's easy. Um, a few years later, in the early 70s, Roger Grisal, a Belgian scholar, said, yes, it's not a problem. And then about 10 years after that, M. George Marimort came along and said, oh, no, 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 no. And, but at the end of his work, he said, but it's not decided. Um, at the Second Vatican Council, you see, there were 101 propositions about the diaconate itself. And two of them uh, focused on women deacons, an Italian bishop and a Peruvian bishop um, and also a Maronite bishop uh, in, in, the, in the breaks were saying, why don't we return to women deacons? Well, according to the secretary to the Maronite bishop, the Latin bishops just didn't want to talk about it. Uh, but two propositions did reach, reach the floor. In October 2015, Canadian Archbishop Paul Andre Duroche made three proposals to the Synod of Bishop after arguing quite strenuously in French for the dignity of women. Two of his proposals focused on women deacons. Specifically, he said we should simply return to this, this uh, historical uh, uh, ministry of our church. Um, the uh, French-English uh, Vatican spokesman at the time neglected to mention this to the uh, English-speaking press. Uh, however, Paul André then made sure that his propositions were on his website in English and in French. But then in May 2016, the International Union of Superiors General um, asked for the commission. It was the second of six questions given advance to Pope Francis for, for this meeting. Um, and, and, and they seriously concerned the, the restoration of women to the diaconate. Uh, he, uh, he had asked for questions in advance and he received them three months in advance, so he knew what was coming. The nuns said, um, we're already doing the work with deacons. Why can't we be restored to this, this ordained ministry? And he said, you know, that's probably a pretty good idea. I can think about that. You know, he said women were uh, 
participated in the baptism of other women. I know this. Uh, I spoke with a Syrian scholar, and, and he said, I, you know what else I know? I know that uh, when a woman accused her husband of beating her, it was the woman deacons who went to examine the bruises, and then they gave testimony to the bishop. And he said, you know, I, there are other parts of this. I think it would be a good idea, he said, to have a commission. And so it, it happened, and it went around the world. And then on the 2nd of August in 2016, I went to my office in Bermuda shorts and t-shirt, and I was reading the uh, email, and it was a lot in Italian, and I said, oh my goodness, there's a, there's a list. And there was a list of 12 scholars in alphabetical order. And I went down, and there I was. Um, and that began uh, three years of, uh, two and a half years of my being asked not to give public lectures. He's the gum. <laughs> so, why do we need women deacons? Well, to provide ministry to women, to let women rejoin the clerical state, and to support the church's teaching that all are made in the image and likeness of God. This is the discussion that's been happening. This is the discussion that was had. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what went on in the commission, but I can tell you more about what went on outside the commission for the past 400 years. Uh, it's a canonical question. I think it's a merely ecclesial law. Uh, but the biggest pushback I have gotten in the offices of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith uh, from a, a, a man, member of the, of the CDF who is no longer with them is that women cannot image Christ. And I say for further information, see number 41, the Baltimore Catechism. Yeah. <laughs> All right. okay. So clarification, am I just doing another completely random topic? You're doing, you're doing what you think. OK. It needs to be reformed. Good evening. So nice to be with you. I spent the past 17 years of my life dealing with the canon law aspects of the sexual abuse crisis. I was in position at the Archdiocese of Boston as a new canon lawyer when the crisis became front page news. I've had a hand in the response of the Archdiocese to the crisis since that time. Currently, I continue to be part of Cardinal O'Malley's team, and now I am part of the United USCCB team. Lately, as most know, in both venues, we are working to ensure accountability of bishops. Throughout the time, and even now, I hear frustration of the people of God with the processes themselves and with the lack of any meaningful lay involvement. It is these two things that I hope are reformed in the future. So I'm speaking canon law here, not any dealings with the state. It's criminal. But I use the word criminal canonically. Before I can posit a reform, I need to give some explanatory history as to why we do what we do. The church set up the first criminal procedures following Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. So if someone sins against you, go talk to them. If they don't listen, bring, some, bring a witness. If they don't listen, bring them to the church. If they don't listen to the church, treat them as a tax collector or a pagan. Right? Matthew 18. Now, without attempting to excuse past bishops in any way, I at least want to point out that in some senses they were following the law by setting these things outside of canonical criminal trials. During the peak of the atrocities, the church was subject to a set of laws created in 1917, and that code urges just that. Canon 2214 of the 1917 code is especially enlightening. <coughs> The entire canon, which I would be happy to share with those interested, is a plea to the bishops to be gentle and to strive to settle the issue outside of canonical trials. I'm assuming with the justification of respecting and over-respecting the clerical state and avoiding scandal. The current law, canon law created in 1983, is an improvement over that. But the attitude of the law still can be used in a way that one only simulates mercy. Mercy must consider all the people affected by each particular situation. In confession, there is only one person affected, so God's forgiveness considers the person and this person's soul. 
when a bishop makes a decision, it must be have all the people of God in mind. And the current law still leaves to the discretion of the bishop too many aspects. For example, if a crime is investigated, if a trial is warranted, how isolated is the priest under the accusation from ministry of any sort? How to handle cases where the priest is not found guilty per se of abusing a minor, but still has acted immorally? Here in Boston and in the United States, if bishops do not act swiftly, definitively, and completely now, they'll be soon out of their offices. But this is not a Boston or a United States problem anymore, and I do not think the law is strong enough and still leaves aspects to the discretion of the bishop, assuming the bishop will act prudently and I would rewrite that law. How would I rewrite it? I would mandate lay involvement. From a purely clerical perspective, I confess that until we had lay people involved, my own thoughts on whether a priest could return to ministry were skewed. Clearly, I'm not speaking about a priest found guilty of abusing a minor, but a priest that had been sinful in indiscriminate ways, especially sexually. Bishop Mark. One minute. One minute. Clerics can still think Clerics can still think the people do not know need to know the priest's past indiscretions. Just send them there. And lay people simply think, I do not want my son or daughter anywhere near a priest like that. Clerics, in other words, still want to settle outside of court, and lay people want to treat them as tax collectors or pagans. The law needs some more of that while still protecting everyone's rights. Bottom line, if I were in Rome, I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow, just allow lay people involvement for certain parts, as the law does. I would mandate it. Thank you also for being here. Thank all of you for being here. Um, in one part of my life, I teach theology to undergraduates. Um, another huge part of my life involves raising two sons with my spouse. This year, our oldest started high school, which is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and terrifying and amazing, all at once for a great many reasons. We're very lucky our son was admitted to what I'm sure every Jesuit institution calls the elite Jesuit institution um, in New York, uh, which is which Regis uh, High School, which is endowed such that all the boys attend for free. Needless to say, we were overjoyed about this. <laughs> it saves us a lot of money, which he reminds us all the time. Um, but we're also nervous about the accelerated curriculum, the solo commute to Manhattan, the abundance of time-consuming extracurriculars, etc. So last week we're at Meet the Teacher Night, and this very nice, extremely young person who is my son's English teacher laid out the first half of the semester. I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna dive right in, is what he said. Um, we're gonna read Edgar Allan Poe, and we're gonna read Oedipus, and we're gonna read Shakespeare, and then it hit me, oh my God. What if he never reads a woman? <coughs> what if in this very elite, single-sex Catholic environment, my son never finds out that women have something interesting to say about history, or storytelling, or theology? Here's the thing. What I don't want for my son, I don't want for my church. It sounds simple, but the execution of this probably won't be. My institutional contribution to the reform of the church would be to dismantle the seminary system as it currently exists. <laughs> no, no, let's not get where it is. that long ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's harder for you to get class. <laughs> um, the isolation. So it's going to be one of those nights. <laughs> <laughs> the isolation of seminaries from real life from women, from chores and housework like laundry, cooking, and cleaning, from the world of the people of God, is the incubator of both clericalism and of the abuse crisis. As one friend put it to me, quote, the seminarians are being raised like rare orchids and are then sent into parishes where nobody cares about horticulture. <laughs> <laughs> this goes beyond even suggesting that seminarians have a year of practicum required in all seminary formation programs. One year is insufficient. Their entire formation should occur alongside lay people. 
The document produced here at Boston College uh, by the Boston College Seminar on Priesthood and Ministry, I found particularly instructive here, and I'm grateful to those of you who were on it, including uh, Rick. In that essay, participants note the blossoming of lay ecclesial ministry, as well as the fact that the majority of both paid and volunteer lay ministers in the church are women. As collaborators in the church, those training to be priests and those training to be lay ecclesial ministers should be in class together. They should recognize the diverse gifts of women and men, of differing women and men, of differing theological approaches, of differing charisms of ministry and different forms of prayer. <coughs> it strikes me that much of the reason why we have kept the current setup of the seminary system can be traced to fear. But most of the things that we were afraid of, that we fear will happen to seminarians, have already happened. And they continue to happen. What are our fears? That the number of vocations will decline? That seminarians will be corrupted? That they will have low morale? Are we afraid that they'll realize that they're not good at everything? Or that a woman might be better at something, like theology or preaching? <laughs> are we worried that they will violate our, their vows? All of those things are already occurring. One. one minute? Great, I'm almost done. So, I would be remiss if I didn't also know that the hard separation between academic theology and seminary theology blossomed at just the time when women entered the Theological Academy. The insularity, tinged with an air of anti-intellectualism that fear of learning with and from women has bred into our church, at the, in our church's highest ranks, is going to take generations to undo. I have some stuff here about collaborative leadership, but we'll get there. A corollary uh, to the integration of lay people at every level of ministerial formation is a negative suggestion that I have. I want to invite us all to stop invoking the threats of clericalizing the laity that I have heard not only from Pope Francis, but from many others, including the theologians that I respect very much, international ones, since this is a complete red herring in the vein of the old standby of confusing the faith. It's the same thing. <laughs> Bringing lay people into decision-making roles in the church, establishing collaborative models of leadership that are taught early on is one way to defeat clericalism. Fretting at the possibility that a lay person might take on the trappings of institutional clericalism, while certainly possible, we don't have a lot of other models of leadership right now, is not a sufficient reason for going back to the drawing board on collaborative leadership. Ultimately, I think the church's survival depends on this leadership. It is an ancient and traditional model of governance. This collaboration cannot merely be among the powerful or the wealthy masters of industry or the cultural elites. It has to be anti-racist and anti-colonial or it will ultimately fail. But I'll do more on that in the next one. I suspect that all of us on this panel are in agreement that any successful program for church reform must attend to our church's deeply embedded clerical and hierarchical culture. I want to focus on but one feature of our modern church that I believe has helped sustain <coughs> that clerical culture, namely the significantly weakened and distorted relationship between the bishop and the local church. What is required, I believe, is a careful and selective recovery of key features of the ancient Episcopal. Today, the local church plays almost no role in the appointment of a bishop. It is the Pope who makes the final decision on Episcopal appointments after benefiting from the advice of the appropriate Vatican office. But this practice of papal appointment, however, became common only in the 19th century and it undermined one of the most widely held convictions of early Christianity concerning the right of the local church to participate in the appointment of their bishop. Even as late as the fifth century, Pope Celestine I would declare, let a bishop not be imposed upon the people whom they do not want. Pope Leo the Great would further insist, he who has to preside over all must be elected by all. Many will agree that a lack of Episcopal accountability lies at the heart of our clerical sexual abuse crisis. A return to the active role of the local church in the selection of a bishop would go a long way toward helping us recover that accountability. 
This commitment to the bishop's essential relationship to the local church was also maintained in the ancient canonical prohibition against the transfer of a bishop from one diocese to another. There were good reasons for this prohibition, and they are found both in the canons of the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Chalcedon. If a bishop of a relatively small diocese was courting promotion to a larger and more significant church, he might be more inclined to act cautiously, concerned with how his actions might be interpreted by those with the power to affect his promotion. By contrast, a bishop who stood in solidarity with his local church, embraced by his local church, and considered himself in a sense married to his local church, however modest, was more inclined to keep the concerns of his people foremost in mind. Finally, in the early church, the only reason to be ordained a bishop was to serve as the pastoral leader of a local church. Yet today, approximately one-third of our active bishops possess what is known as a titular see. That is <laughs> but, but wait. <laughs> Technically, they are given title or made pastor of a church that no longer exists. This is the case for auxiliary bishops like Bishop O'Connell, who in fact is the bishop of Gigthi, a once existent diocese in Tunisia that stopped existing after the 7th century. <laughs> However, not only auxiliary bishops, but also Vatican diplomats and bureaucrats are elevated, note the language, to the office of bishop and given a titular see. It is time for the church to repudiate this practice. There is no good reason for Vatican bureaucrats and diplomats to be ordained bishop in the first place. Making them bishops simply reinforces the idea that ordination is an honorific, an ecclesiastical promotion or advance in rank and privilege rather than a call to service. And if a diocese is large enough that it requires multiple bishops, we ought to seriously consider dividing it up into smaller dioceses, where each would have their own pastor. So let me be clear. I am not trying to undermine Bishop O'Connor's Episcopal <laughs> ministry. I want to give him his own diocese. <laughs> I admit that these three reforms do not seem particularly sexy. But taken together, they would do a great deal to move us toward a much more healthy and solidaristic relationship between the bishop and the local church, and therefore make our ecclesial leadership more accountable. Okay. I'm glad that one's over now. Okay, so I asked them. But the first set of questions, what structural or institutional reform would you implement? Phil suggested resurrecting women deacons, which would do a better job of reflecting the tradition of the earliest church and also give more voice to over half of the church's faithful. Bishop O'Connell said that in terms of the canonical structure of the church, that lay people do not have enough of a say in overseeing how the church's rules or canons are actually implemented, especially now that we're in the middle of the sex abuse crisis. And the greater role of the faithful would in fact be to offer both buy-in and also assure people that the church takes the concerns of the faithful seriously. Natalia said that the inclusion of women is absolutely necessary because in fact, without not including their voices in what we talk about and in the issues that we are concerned with and also sort of figuring out what kind of institutional roles women should have. In fact, leaves off over half the talent that makes up the church. It also does serious sort of damage to our idea that all the baptized are in the image and likeness of Christ. And finally, Rick Gallardi suggested that the lack of Episcopal accountability um, to the local church, and indeed the lack of real power or say of the local church in choosing its bishop has led to a very, actually in a strange kind of way, modern and not ancient understanding of what bishops do and also what bishops related, bishops' relations to their diocese should be. In the second round, I've asked them either to expand 
on the first point they made, their idea about reform of the church, or if they wanted to become more theoretical or even theological, to, to bring up a question in theology that they think the church needs to address to reform itself. So, Thank you. Um, well, on, on the point of lay uh, involvement as well as women involvement, it's rather the same thing. Uh, and But in any event, I said that uh, it's important to support our church's teachings that all are made in the image and likeness of God. Um, there is no doctrinal teaching against women to be ordained as deacons. It is a merely ecclesi ecclesiastical law. Okay. Interim seniors in 1976 uh, gave uh, two reasons, basically. One, the iconic argument women cannot image Christ, and secondly, the argument from authority women uh, Jesus or De Jesus chose male apostles. Um, that's about priesthood, and it was specifically pointed out by Cotter, the secretary at the time of the CDF, that uh, women deacons were left aside. Or Nazio Sacerdotalis in 1994 absolutely drops the iconic argument. Some people say it's implied. Um, I, I don't think so, but the argument from authority uh, is still there. So to begin with, the, the theological points that are brought up are not necessarily theological. Um, in 1997, there was an ITC document prepared that said yes, it was numbered, it was printed, but the president of the CDF at the time, Colonel Joseph Ratzinger, refused to sign it, refused to promulgate it, and instead uh, named a new commission, a new, a new uh, subcommission of the ITC, seven men, who found uh, one that women deacons didn't do the same thing as men deacons and the liturgical ceremonies were different, but that the church as magisterium teaches the diaconate and the priesthood are, are distinct and therefore it's something for the magisterium to decide. So they basically gave a non-answer um, after 10 years where after five years they gave a yes. Um, so what what is the theological argument? Well, basically, to originally to deny the sacramentality of historical ordinations, we have a lot of documents, a lot of, of uh, liturgies that demonstrate that women were sacramentally ordained according to the uh, the uh, the uh, criteria of the Council of Trent. Jean Morin in the 18th century and Jean Pien, uh, John Moran in the 17th century, Jean Pien in the 18th century had this discussion. Uh, Moran said yes, Pien said no, the same argument. But what happened? They were ordained during mass by the bishop, inside the altar rail, in the presence of the male and female deacons and the presbyters. The bishop lays either a hand or two hands on the woman candidate, he invokes the Holy Spirit very, very important because uh, because it is the Holy Spirit that does the whole heavy lifting in, in, uh, in ordination. The epiclesis is definitely present in the ordination of women deacons. It gives her a stole. The stole is the, basically the symbol that she's allowed to preach. Um, she self-communicates. She takes the chalice and she self-communicates. Big deal. She is touching the sacred. And he calls her a deacon. If he wasn't a deacon, he'd call her something else. Women, now the argument that women cannot image Christ, the iconic argument, is still extant. Uh, Cotter said about priesthood, Christ is, was, and remains a man. And that is where the impersona Christi, Captus Ecclesiae, impersona Christi Servi argument comes up. Um, the impersona Christi Servi uh, uh, term came up only in 2002. Previously, when, uh, previously, deacons were in nomine ecclesia. So, the other part of it, the initiative of order. Because a woman cannot be ordained a priest, she therefore cannot be ordained as a deacon. However, we know women were ordained as deacons, so that argument actually turns on its head and can be thought to say that therefore women can be priests. It's not my argument, but it is the reverse of what is, of what is, uh, what is said all the time to me, that. Uh, uh, if you can ordain a woman a deacon, you can ordain her a priest. We can talk later about the cursus on Orem, uh, which uh, is the byproduct of, uh, of, in law of the uh, Gregorian reform, when no one could be ordained a deacon unless he was on the way to become a priest. Am I allowed to speak? <laughs> 
So this is not a continuation, it's a different subject. So real evangelization should not be scare tactics. One should not be disciplined to follow Christ church's rules simply to avoid hell. Rather, real conversion of heart comes from embracing the cross and taking on the discipline of practice because one feels called to do it. Conversions based on fear rarely work. Stephen Daedalus in a portrait of the artist as a young man, scared out of his mind by the preacher who describes hell in all its putrid details, runs through the streets of Dublin right into the confessional. But was that a conversion? As someone who has listened to many confessions of our young people, there's many that are still subject to the austere life of hell avoidance that leads to scrupulosity. But is it a lasting faith? Our church is divided. And those on the far right are already offended with what I just said. I have held many what we call Ask a Bishop Nights. There's often a division in the room between those who think the church should be tougher and would prefer, prefer a morality check of anyone who dares to go to Mass, and those who think the church is too strict. This first group says, where are the rules? The church has weakened itself by taking away the discipline we used to have. And the other group says, the church has too many rules. <laughs> Frankly, I am not attracted to the vision of either of these two churches. And yet, when Catholics try to come back to the practice of the faith, they are often met by one of the two. I'm not interested in the church of the extreme right. Pope Francis even contemplates something different. There's wailing and gnashing of teeth. To even hold a listening session with Catholics who question their identity is seen as scandalous. On the other hand, I'm not in the least attracted to the church at the far left where one's own ideas rule supreme. Jesus Christ established the church and the magisterium of the church has adapted to, to every age but it remains unyielding to the primacy of self and holds firmly to the rock of Peter. The Eucharist is the Eucharist when it is faithful to what Jesus said to do in his memory, and he did not use rice. It is not insensitive to use gluten. It is simply not the Eucharist without at least a small amount. There is a creed we follow, and it is not brought for negotiation. There is a moral practice we proclaim, and it isn't pro-choice. But when a baptized Catholic has rediscovered their faith in the Catholic Church after having been away from it for a while, they are more likely to run into the extreme right or left picture of our church based on who is loudest on the internet. The reform of the church I long for is for the more centrist, moderate, normal, everyday church to be consciously louder. It is not easy to be a moderate in public debate in our church doesn't grab headlines on Twitter. It's not even heard yet. Yet the majority of our practicing faithful Catholics in the pews are that. But guess what? Our pews are missing three generations of Catholics. High school students, their parents, and the millennials in between. Bishop Barron gave an image when he spoke to the Boston priest. He compared finding one's faith in the church to finding one's love for baseball. How do we learn to love baseball? By going to the ballpark and seeing the crowds and hearing the crack of the bat and looking at the action. Yeah, one minute. You fall in love with baseball long before you learn the infield fly rule. Sometimes when people come back to church, instead of falling in love with the liturgy, we start with the infield fly rule. Are you divorced? Are you gay? Are you married in the church? Are you committing mortal sin by not going to Mass? All this leads me to simply propose the church create a voluntary, meaningful re-entry process equivalent to the RCIA for returning Catholics. The process would excuse the person from Sunday obligation while they're in the program by way of a dispensation so they are ready to desire to go back to Holy Communion. It would lovingly explain marriage in the church before inviting them to consider marrying in the church and would lead the person to be ready to make a meaningful confession that we return them safely to the true faith and guide them to the right and left extremes. It would proactively run to embrace the prodigal son without watering down or weaponizing the faith.
theoretical proposal is that we begin the work of decolonizing the church. Coloniality is an idea from a Peruvian thinker, Anila Quijano is his name, um, also relying on the work of Puerto Rican scholars here, Melissa Pagan and Teresa Delgado, I feel the need to shout them out so that you can read their books too. Um, it, it's more than just the domination of some state over another state, though its roots are there. It's instead the domination of one culture or rationality or imaginative horizon, and the elevation of this horizon above all others to the point where we get to almost an epistemic violence. Right? We're cut off from other ways to know, or to think, or to organize, or even to imagine. The marriage of the church to colonialism is centuries long, and it will not be dissolved in a decade, much less in these four minutes that I have right yeah. now. But we have to begin, and I want to point to two places where I think we can embark on this important work. One, a central feature of coloniality is the subjugation and instrumentalization of persons. In theological circles, where previous generations of Latinx, Latino theologians saw mestizaje, right, a mixture of cultures that gives forth this new culture and creates sort of Mexico or something like that, this generation sees coloniality and the erasure of particularity in the service of colonial power. So rather than this mestizaje that can be a little bit romanticized, this new generation sees European explorers encountering new peoples and making Indians out of Aztecs and Incas and Nazcas, and making, enacting a slave trade and making blacks out of Yorubas, Congos, Ashantis, etc. Persons are reclassified and new categories are created that reduces people to the role that they'll play in the economy. The US does this as well in a second moment when it creates Hispanics. <laughs> but the church is not exempt either. The US church also instrumentalizes Latinos because the Latino Catholic is also raced according to his and her functionality, being obedient and tolerant and resilient in a Catholicism that bleeds membership and courts a crisis of moral authority and is financially precarious. A first step in the work of decolonizing our faith has to be to stop a reliance on these tired stereotypes and to allow persons from this, these wildly diverse, marginalized, wounded reality, not only to feature in our ecclesial concepts and structures, but to shape those ecclesial concepts and structures. Which brings me to the second step. It's an interrogation of the relationship between the church and culture. This is a bigger, a deeper ask, I think, a tougher thing to do. But what I'm asking us to do is to identify where our understanding of what is non-negotiable or unchangeable about the church, structurally or otherwise, comes from. Um, I, this summer, I read this book by Mark Jordan on the sex abuse crisis here in Boston called Telling Truths in Church. Um, and he said that the sex abuse scandal reveals to us that the line between loyalty and co complicity is precariously thin. And I think we should turn an interrogating eye toward the coloniality embedded in our faith. I see and was formed in a, co a tendency to imagine even subconsciously that this Euro-American dominated iteration of the faith is definitive. And included in that notion of definitive, a cultural superiority or a triumphalism in terms of European Christianity. Okay. One minute. Um, so just think about the panic about the Synod on the Amazon, right? It's always couched as, oh God, what if something changes? Not, maybe something will change. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's always, how can the church be more imposed on the Amazon and not what will the Amazon do to the church? Um, in part, we're all committed to this colonial project because we're all shaped by its expectations, we're shaped by its rationality, we're sitting at a university. And our imaginations are shaped by notions of progress and order. Coloniality tells us what counts as legitimate development and what counts as syncretic innovation. I'm inviting us to step away from these if real reform is going to happen in Catholicism and remind ourselves that the line between loyalty to and complicity in structures that harm marginalized communities, black bodies, brown bodies, women's bodies, LGBTQ bodies, is terribly thin. To give ourselves over to the spirit and to remind ourselves that an open wound heals from the margins in, and that is where we should focus our attention. So when I say something mushy like we should center the voices of the marginalized, what I want you to hear is not let's be nice to the new immigrant family in the parish, although obviously that is important, but I want you to hear the cry beyond the cry for reform. 
the cry of generations of colonized, homogenized, and brutalized bodies, and to do right by them. So I'd like to raise two broader theological issues that, in my view, need more development. The first is to suggest that we need, and you can see this is a kind of an ecclesiological approach, we need a new, not that the others won't, we need a new theology to justify ecclesial belonging. Let me explain. One of the unanticipated consequences of the Second Vatican Council proceeded from the Council's commitment to what we might speak of as a salvific optimism. The Council readily admitted that salvation might be encountered outside of formal membership in the Roman Catholic Church. This teaching, which I wholly affirm, undercut a centuries-old rationale for ecclesial belonging, namely fear of damnation. The pastoral life of the church in the decades before the council was in many ways configured to this concern to secure one's salvation. But this also encouraged a kind of ministerial complacency. Although many exemplary priests went beyond the pastoral minimum, the fact of the matter is that priests generally did not have to worry about the quality of their preaching or of the liturgical experience of the community. The principal responsibility of the priest was to provide Catholics a trustworthy sacramental conduit to God's saving grace. Since the Council, the absolute necessity of the sacraments has been attenuated, but the pastoral complacency on all of our parts has in many ways continued. This pastoral complacency is evident in mediocre preaching, minimal participation in the life of the parish by the vast majority of the baptized, tepid liturgical celebrations, and a shocking lack of hospitality toward young people, LGBT persons, or those of a different socioeconomic, ethnic, or racial background. Put simply, in the face of a widespread exodus from the church, particularly among young adults, we have failed to make the case for why, if one's salvation no longer depends on being in the church, anyone should want to. We need a practical ecclesiology that makes the case for why belonging to a real community of faith still matters. Second, we need to do more work, and this is quite different from first, on a theology of holy orders. I'm not going to solve this problem in a minute and a half. <laughs> to be honest, we actually stand in need of a more adequate theological account of all forms of ministry, something that I think Natalia has brought out, ordained and non-ordained. But because of time constraints, I want to focus on a pressing need to reimagine the relationship of ordination uh, uh, to a theology of power. For too long, our theology of ordination has focused narrowly on the interior change that ordination affects within the ordinon. This has led us to think of ordination as a matter of conferring a discrete set of new powers upon the ordinon. A number of theologians have suggested, by contrast, that our theology of orderly orders not begin with the conferral of power but rather with the establishment of a new ecclesial relationship, an ecclesial repositioning, if you will. One is ordained to be for and with God's people in a new and public way. Now, such an ordination does involve genuine sacramental empowerment, but this empowerment follows upon and is configured to the new ecclesial relationship to which the ordinon is consecrated. Further developments in this theology of orders, by focusing on sacramental empowerment in service of the community, would also help us go much further in addressing the problems of an endemic clerical culture. Thank you very much. Please join me. Sir. A large part of the, today's discussion is focused on giving a wider voice to people in the pews. 
And this is where all of you come in. So our, our one of our wonderful undergraduate research fellows will uh, carry around the mic and I ask you to wait until she reaches you, please put up your hand and she will um, uh, bring you the mic and ask the question to either the panel or to a student. There's a bunch of people up here. Sorry. Yeah, well, please give us your first name, please. Uh, Jack Cahalan, I uh, was, had the privilege of sponsoring two five-day canonical retreats for priests in the Archdiocese of Boston and one Diocese of Pittsburgh on pastoral reform. Everything said here today, I agree with 100%. It's excellent, it doesn't get to the real problem, except for some of the things that Professor Richard said at the very end. The real problem, as a friend of mine, when I told him I was giving a retreat on pastor reform, he said to me, if the apostles had pastored the way we're pastored, the church would not have survived. And as a matter of fact, the church is not surviving while we're being pastored in this way. So seminary reform, yes, but much, much deeper. So do one, you have a question for a specific Yes, question? one thing, just to prove my point. Everybody who's out of a seminary should know, should, know, should know all this. What do the epistles repeatedly and explicitly teach is the main motivator by which Christians are moved to Christian behavior. What is the main motivator a pastor should use to motivate the epistles say it all over the place? Nobody knows it. Thank okay. You. Would anyone like to address this? I'm on the cliff. Okay. Right. <laughs> yes. Julian, there's somebody in the back. Julian, where are you? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Bob. Um, my question uh, would pick up on Dr. Gillardi's point, but any of the panelists could feel free to answer. Um, I work for a group, D Ways Ministry, with LGBTQ Catholics, uh, and I do work in other reform circles, and so I spend time with um, groups, you could call them paraclesial groups. They are um, intentional Eucharistic communities, Roman Catholic women priest parishes, groups that are not canonically sanctioned, but in many ways these are faithful Roman, particularly Roman Catholics, and the question I'm always turning over, so I hope maybe there's answers up there, is um, what but not just practically, I think practically it's a little easier, but in developing an ecclesiology that's adequate for our church today, what role do these paraclesial communities and the, the wounded and excluded folks in them, um, this, this is sort of why the belonging, we, we've chosen to stick around against all odds, so what role can we play in, in, in the more theoretical sense that our groups have a place? What about answers? Well, I probably don't need a microphone. Yeah. Bob, it's a very good question. Sure. I mean, there are not a lot. Oh, okay. Yes, I do need a microphone. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a lot of ways of going at this, but one of the things, Bob, that I think is important is, and, and Natalia's actually written on this, though, in a slightly different context. I think we need to expand our conventional understanding of one of the most important teachings of the Council, the supernatural instinct for the faith that's given to all the baptized. We have a tendency, I think, to think of the census for day uh, in terms of you know those formerly baptized Catholics that are in good standing and so on and so forth, and therefore to conveniently exclude uh, the voices, the insights, the experience of people who experience themselves as perhaps not quite in the center of the church, but on the margins, or perhaps in a position of exile, uh, where they're not quite sure whether they would describe themselves as belonging or not belonging. But it doesn't change the fact that we believe that God's grace, God's wisdom, and God's insight uh, can speak through those marginalized communities. So I think we have, the cur have to have the courage to listen not just to people who are in quote-unquote good standing, but to trust in sort of the, the promiscuity of the spirit to speak through a wider range of voices and, and from a wider range of ecclesial vocations than we tend to conventionally uh, acknowledge. Um, I, just to add to it, thank you for reminding me that I did write on that. Yeah. <laughs> you could buy her book outside. Yes. Uh, 
that the idea that um, how can these these paraclesial groups uh, contribute to reform? The, I think the most exciting thing is that we don't know. We don't know it because we never allow these groups. Women aren't voting in the Senate on the Amazon. We don't know. We don't know what the church would look like if we could all really participate. And so um, I think the one way to do it is to continue that kind of prophetic witness, to continue to claim your name as Catholic, to continue to claim that identity. And that sort of keeps the, the cell wall open and breathing so that the church doesn't die. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your hanging in. It's important. I, I'm spending my, I'm bishop three years, spent as much time as I can uh, listening and dialoguing. And right now, I would hope that we come up with a common language. We can't speak to each other because we define things so differently. And so when we speak about marriage, you're speaking about one thing. Church uh, has a, a teaching that, that they'll stick to. You think about gender, church speaks about one thing, and you mean something else. Uh, they can't get over the fact there's two genders. End of discussion. Well, there's a whole bunch of people telling us they have different identities. We need, we need to take the time to listen to each other with language that we won't get tense over. And that's something I'm working on. Another question? There's a whole bunch of questions. Why don't we take somebody over on the left? I like questions from the left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and opposition to it, how do you reconcile tradition that comes from scriptural doctrine to tradition that has come to the church from political or societal influence and has shaped how the church still is today? Uh, I, think, I think the question is the collision of the teachings of scripture uh, and uh, cultural accretions of that. And, and the fact of the matter is there are a lot of cultural things, uh, cultural questions that uh, do collide with scripture. Mm. I, I can't get it out of my head that I sat at table with a member of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith who looked me in the eye and said, I cannot image Christ. Um, this to me is horrendous. Mm. But if we look around the world, there are other cultures that find that women are not fully human, that women are able to be beaten. Uh, the problem of dowry burning, the problem of sex trafficking, the problem of FGM, all of these problems, uh, to me, come from cultures uh, that have not received scripture. And yet when we look in scripture, we find that Jesus had many women followers. Jesus had many uh, women who uh, brought his word out. Uh, the only woman in scripture with the job title deacon is Phoebe. And Paul introduces her as the deacon of the church at Sencrae. You know, we have in 1 Timothy 3 to 11, we have evidence that the women also uh, needed to have these qualities of being deacons. So um, I think in today's cultures around the world, we find an uneven recognition of the value of woman and an even recognition of the value of the person, um, and that it's, it's up to the church to preach its, its scripture, to preach its believings, and to convince the world um, that women indeed are human, women indeed are made in the image and likeness of Christ, of God. Great question, Amy. Uh, just briefly, the only thing I would caution is putting, and maybe I didn't quite hear it right, but putting scripture here and then putting kind of cultural influences here. Because I would, I would tell you, first of all, that scripture is shot through with human culture because it is a human community that gives testimony to what God has done in their lives. And they do that, as we all do, through the matrix of our experience of culture. So you can't ever bracket out culture, right? I mean, 
the, to the extent that we believe that God enters into the human story, God enters into human cultures. And those human cultures are both grace and wounded. And it's part of the work of a Christian community is to kind of sort through that, to discern that through the power of the Spirit. Um, yeah. Work. We still have a, a very persistent gentleman in the middle. Okay. I'm going to stay in First, I just have to like appreciate both of the women on this panel because both of you largely formed my undergrad research and what it meant as a young person who was struggling to stay in the church when I used both of your imagery of women being part of such intimate, sacramental, and especially also brown women, it changed my vocation and it was empowering and it has allowed me to stay, but I was only able to do that in my last year of eight years of Jesuit education. Yeah. <laughs> and now I am getting my master's and I, I'm seeing this disappearance again of these female voices, but also racially diverse female voices. What have either of you seen in like tangible examples of whether it's Jesuit education, Catholic education, at the high school level, at the university level, really making the effort to incorporate women, women of color, women in the, in the curriculum starting from freshman in high school all the way up to age. Thank you. Um, I, I also went to, well, I only did four years of Jesuit education. Uh, yeah. The capstone was really Mark's class. It got no better than that. Um, I think one thing that I talk about a lot with my students and that has really kind of come home to me through their activism and their questions and their pushing is um, this nagging uh, genealogy question, right? How come the feminists don't get their work out? Why am I just finding out about this now? I'm like, the feminists have been publishing their work for years and years and years. How come you never read it? And that's where, like, that's where the sort of me, the teacher, and I just like slapped me in the face, and I was like, oh my gosh. So I think um, that one way, like, we we don't all have diverse faculties. My faculty is not diverse. Um, my student body is far ahead of us in that regard. But your syllabus can be diverse. Um, and if it's not, it's okay to tell your professor, how come we're not reading any people of color in this class? Because if we do not do that work of genealogy, we condemn every next generation to having to rebuild the infrastructure. And the more I read, the more I realize that this is not accidental. It's intentional. And it makes young women waste time rebuilding that infrastructure. So let's make sure that we do that with all of our syllabi, all of the books we read our kids from the time that they're, you know, babies until the present so that they know that there's wisdom all over all kinds of people. Sorry. Can I make one comment on the way by? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> an honorary woman right now. <laughs> Just to promote canon law for women, it's, it's, uh, it's, totally underutilized path to decision making uh, and um, to have more women get degrees at pontifical universities would greatly help the future of this church. I, I will respond. I looked into that and the thing that deterred me is that there wasn't a single female on most of the faculty that I looked up in the university of Canada. Like, there was a female. Because I didn't think about that. Do you want to be a pioneer? <laughs> Yes, yes and no. Uh, the first uh, pontifical degree given to a woman in Rome was in 1970 X. I can't remember. To Mary Milligan, the second was given to Sandra Schneider's from the Greg. And, and uh, because they got them not the the same No, no, the first ones were in the 70s uh, to, to Mary Milligan and Sandra Schneider's, then Beth Johnson, 1984, at, at uh, CUA. Um, even if a woman is a canonist, she cannot be a single judge in a canonical trial because she's not a cleric. 
she can't preach. So, so there, there are things that clerical studies have. But to encourage you, I will tell you that uh, I would ask you to write. Uh, I didn't know anybody. Uh, I never met the sisters of the International Union of Superiors General who appointed me uh, to, the, to ask me to be appointed to the commission. The commission was the first, as far as I know, uh, to be 50-50 male-female. Okay? And the women professors on it have published. Many of them have published. Many of them were known in Rome. But I, I would really, really encourage you to, as, as uh, Bishop, Bishop O'Connell says, you know, get a canon law degree or get a PhD or go to a pontifical institution, but write and publish. Okay. I see that. Just to uh, back up what Bishop Mark said, um, when I was ordained, I, be I became eventually the dean of the STM across the street. But before that, I was a student before my ordination at Weston, which was in Cambridge. There was 20 of us in my class, eight lay people, all of whom were women, five of whom went to Canon Law School, and they're all now chancellors of dioceses. So they went on mostly to St. Paul in, in Ottawa, and they're all now running dioceses. So there are women who went on to have certainly a bigger say than I have in any issue in the local church. I think Pro Professor Groom was at his seat. Okay. Oh, oh, They're chancellors of dioceses who can't sign certain documents because they are not clerics. <laughs> Alejandro Olario Mendez. Uh, following along the lines on colonial and decolonial discourse, what can we make, what can we do in academia, especially theological reflection, to make sure that we include voices that are colonized? I mean, one way to do it is, of course, the, the syllabus. But still, as diverse as the panel, this panel is, and this idea of including more voices in our syllabus, is it still this reflection, theological reflection, is made from a place of power. Absolutely. University, education, city. So the question is, what can we make, what can we do to make sure that those voices that are more diverse, where probably the needs are different for the churches in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, and the priorities are completely different. What can we make sure that we hear those voices and we include them in our theological reflection? Thank you very much for that question. That's excellent and a challenge to all of us, I think. Um, one concrete proposal that I would make that I think um, it does remain in the halls of power, but I think it opens up, is to make um, Spanish a theological language that counts for yes. um, <laughs> and other, you know, other languages from the global south. I don't only mean Spanish, but Spanish is so widely spoken, and it is so not included in the competency um, exams for uh, higher ed or high, advanced theological degrees. There's so much theology that is written um, from the global south that we don't read, or that nobody is. Uh, we don't build capacity for students to even read, um, and even that would begin to hear voices that we don't hear. Like I was gonna say, read more widely, but we can't read widely if we don't read multilingual. So, rather than just French and German. Um. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, the, the, I want to go back to Phyllis's fine presentation, and I appreciate, Phyllis, your excellent scholarship that indicates that the women were ordained deacons of the church. But let me ask the question this way. Supposing we've never ordained women deacons in the past, surely we should do so now That's true. and into the future. In other words, if we, if we simply say, well, unless we did in the past, we can't do it now, I, I'd be afraid of that argument, especially when it comes to women in the, in the other two functions of holy orders, in episcopacy and priesthood, that maybe we can't find a woman bishop, although St. Bridget of Kildare, as we all know, was, the, was definitely consecrated a bishop. I'm from Kildare, by the way. St. <laughs> <laughs> Bridget of Kildare, there's lots of evidence in the Book of this form, the 8th century uh, Irish church, that they ordained St. Bridget. But even if, they, even if they don't accept that, uh, why build the argument? Because there's lots of things the church used to do that it never should have done, and maybe some of it has even stopped doing. So if we build it on what we used to do, I'm thinking of something like, for some reason it comes to me, like my mother used to talk about the churchy of women after being given birth, that they couldn't receive the Eucharist for a month afterwards because they'd spilled blood until they were officially uh, churched again. There's all kinds of horrible things we've done in the past, and thank God we stopped doing some of them. So in other words, why build it all on whether or not we did it in the past? Because 
even if we didn't do it in the past, we should certainly do it in the present and the future. Yeah, the Holy Father asked about history. And it was so, his response when he was asked. That, that the, yeah, the Holy Father asked about history, um, and the response from history is positive, although people will argue back and forth and have been arguing that for 400 years. So uh, what are the next arguments against women being ordained? One, women cannot image Christ, the iconic argument, and, and, uh, um, and second, the unity of order. So uh, it, it, the historical argument is important because if you will agree that women were sacramentally ordained and you ordered, uh, argue the ordinacy of order, then you are arguing that women can also be ordained as priests and bishops, uh, which sends everybody into a tailspin. Um, so then, then you go back to the iconic argument and you say, well, even if we uh, leave aside the history, whether they were or were not, um, and leave aside the, uh, the unity of order, where they have to be or don't have to be, well, then you have the problem, the question of can a woman image Christ? And this is, this is seriously presented uh, to people, that only a man can represent the risen Lord. It is heretical. And the Con Camelango said, it's, it's heretical. I said, well, you know, tell the boys across the street. <laughs> uh, because because uh, this, is, this is still presented and believed. Now, now Tom, I think that, that, that if we are to um, dismiss history, uh, we, do, we do it at our peril. Uh, because by dismissing history, we dismiss the rich history of the ministry of women and the many, many things we, that they did. We know they baptized, we know that they, uh, uh, they were involved with annulment proceedings, okay? Uh, Daniel Lou writes that they anointed. Uh, the Maronite Patriarch of, uh, of uh, Damascus tells me that, uh, yes, of course they anointed, and it was sacramental anointing, as Daniel Lou says. There are many, many, I, I just finished writing a book with the sacraments that women deacons per, 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 uh, 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 performed. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think all three history, um, uh, the iconic argument, and the honesty of order um, have gotten so convoluted that if we give up history, and I think that's what you're coming to, um, we will lose the other two. And so uh, so we need to recognize that the bishop who ordained a woman using a formulae, which which according to the criteria of Council of Trent are sacramental. Okay, if we agree that that bishop intended to do as the church did, well then the church can simply recover its tradition. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's the easiest. The Holy Father said in, in May of, of 2019, I was in the hall, um, that if he's gonna write a sacramental decree, he wants it to come include history. Uh, now, including history didn't, is not what made me fall off my chair. What did make me fall off my chair was he wants to write a sacramental decree. So, and I went home and started it. Well, but. Um, thank you. My uh, question is for Dr. Imperatory Lee because of what you raised on seminary reformation. My name is Gus, and I'm a graduate student in the School of Theology and Ministry across the way, a school where seminarians study alongside the laity. And this isn't the only one in the United States alone. There are other institutions like the CTU in Chicago, the Oblate School in San Antonio. The two-parter question I have for you and anyone else who wants to answer are, are institutions like these the ones that you have in mind for the future of seminaries? And two, if so, should these institutions be expanded or will we need to build entirely new ones? And how should we go about doing that? That's a really good question. Um, uh, this, that is the model that I have in mind, right? Something like the SDM, uh, Notre Dame was like this, right? Where the, there was an MDiv program and everybody was training together. Um, yeah, so the graduate schools do sort of co-train um, for ministry, but those are priests that are normally um, in religious orders. So I would want to incorporate the diocesan uh, formation into institutions like that. I don't know. Do we build new ones? Sure, why not? What do you think? We yeah. did it once. 
Oh, and they've been closed after the Vatican visitation of seminaries. A number of us in this room have taught in, in them. And diocesan seminaries that allow women and men to sit together in the same MDiv program, et cetera, have been closed. Well, there you go. It's a part of your the mystery. Or the women, or the women have been, have been uh, allowed to do a pastoral ministry. That's right. So we can return to the practice of the church, right? Anybody Just else? undo what was done. Actually, I want to build on what Natalia said earlier. That's, I think there are two dimensions to what she was proposing. Uh, one, we do quite well at the STM. That is to say, lay people in seminary and studying together. The second has to do with residential yes. question, right? And that's a little bit more provocative. And one of the things that I was hearing Natalia say, though, I'm, I'm going to, to some extent put words in her mouth. Because it, the, it begs the question, if they don't stay in a secluded seminary that is a residential setting set apart from other people, what do we do with them? And, and I would propose, I suspect you would agree, why aren't we encouraging them to live in smaller houses associated with parishes where they're in, in a regular basis interacting with the kind of people that they would serve. So they're being immersed precisely in the pastoral setting where they'll spend the majority of their lives. Right? The only thing I would add to that is that there would be no staff. <laughs> No staff. No staff. I don't disagree. <laughs> Hi, uh, is that, my name is Ken Getz. I said I'm an undergraduate student, uh, and I just reverted back to the faith like four months ago. Um, and um, is that just from my experience in coming back to the church? Of um, I've had great concern about like the catechesis, and specifically the recent pupil um, about uh, is that belief in the real presence, um, and um, especially coming from a Catholic high school and Catholic grade school. Um, and coming from a community that's very privileged in the amount of resources that we had, that many in the community, uh, is, that, is that many of my fellow students didn't get the necessary catechesis when they had all the resources. Uh, so how can we ensure kind of uniform, is that instruction and then also then belief in these, uh, in, is that in these important doctors and uh, uh, dogmas and doctrines? Um, and then kind of second totally different question of um, is that, uh, where uh, is that this would be more for Professor uh, Zagano of the role of uh, uh, lay cardinals, uh, where um, uh, where women wouldn't even have to become part of the episcopate to become cardinals, and then maybe is that fulfill uh, um, roles in the diplomatic corps or various other areas? Is it's been theoretically possible? And I just want to get your comments as well as anyone else in the panel, and then also on catechesis. Thank you. Okay. Well, only, uh, only in the 1983 code does it, does it say that one needs to be at least a priest in order to be named a cardinal, and it is expected that that priest will will accept of his coordination. It'll be interesting to see whether Cherney, uh, who's just been named as a is a priest, is Jesuit priest, if he uh, accepts uh, ordination. Uh, every cardinal Dulles did not. In terms of lay cardinals, the last two. Uh, kind of died around the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Antonelli was well known, and he was made a cardinal before he was made a deacon, uh, which brings me back to women deacons, of course. Uh, I think that uh, your first question about uh, catechesis is important, and it redounds to the way women feel about the church, because the catechesis of the church historically has been done by women, by mothers, by catechists. And they are, as I have written and published yesterday, uh, walking away together, uh, walking away from the church. The schism to worry about is when all the women walk away. So uh, sure, Lake Cardinals, Jim Keenan actually nominated me. I think he nominated Marianne Hinsdale and a few other fabulous folks. So, um, but that's that's not, didn't happen this time. <laughs> First of all, welcome back. We need you. We need, we need you desperately. And so I'm so glad that you have given us a, a, uh, another look. I'm glad that someone sp spread the faith to you. And I, I hope that you ground yourself in that faith. You keep your journey with you and God 
And then, when you feel ready, empower others. You need to be an evangelist. We all do. But thank you for your witness tonight. One by one. That's that's what we have to do. Yeah, so. Rick is very excited about that first question. So. I'm sorry, I don't want to stick on this, except that poll drove me nuts, so I, just, I can't resist saying that. First of all, the poll was horribly worn in a lot of ways, and anybody who has a, an advanced understanding of Catholic theology around sacramental real presence understands that you don't oppose real presence to symbolic modalities, right? Augustine himself spoke of Christ who's present per modem symboli, right? And so what we need is to recover a more robust understanding of what we mean by effective symbols when we talk about Eucharistic presence. But even beyond that, I just want to encourage you, I think we tend to make way too much of those polls. I don't know that there's a generation in the history of Christianity where a significant number of believers wouldn't have failed a test on any of those kinds of things. That doesn't speak to the orthodoxy of their faith. We need to focus on the priority of people's lived faith. My maternal grandmother had a profound devotion to the Eucharist. I suspect if you pressed her, to explain to me real presence, what I would have heard was a form of what we call physicalism. Now, I don't think for a moment she didn't have a profound and orthodox faith in the Eucharist, but her ability to, with some conceptual rigor to articulate that is a separate question altogether, and frankly, I think, rather overrated relative to the significance of how people actually perform the faith of the church. Ma'am, you have the you have the honor of asking the last question. Oh, the last one. So make it a good one. Before I came here, I leaved through this book left by Bishop Robert Barron, and it's around in a lot of the churches now, about a letter to a suffering church. And I would like to just cite one sentence that really caught my eye and, and speaks. It speaks to me. He says, uh, the church is not an organization. It's an organism. Ooh. <laughs> an organism. And I wish that you would speak to this. Says to me, it's something that live, is living, breathing, can move, can change, can adapt, can do necessary changes without searching in the background for years for some kind of precedent that an institution had provided. Thank you. Um, two comments. Number one, I think that sometimes when we say that the church is, when we use sort of symbolic poetic language for the church, like the physical <coughs> body, or something like that. What we're trying to do is avoid questions of justice um, in a church that is not very good at justice. Um, but I, I like the idea of the church as an organism because in this in this Mark Jordan book that I read, which I thought I was using to prepare for this, but it was really just more edifying for me, he talks about the different kinds of truth that the sex abuse scandal revealed. And one of those truths that I will, I want to embroider it, it's so good is the truth of the open wound. And I think if I were to identify the organism that the church is right now, that's it, right? It's an open wound. It's bleeding, it's prone to infection, it's prone to manipulation, it hurts, and something needs to be done about it before this gets a lot worse and we need to start talking about amputation. And so my, my suggestion for the open wound is that wounds heal from the margins in, right? That's how they close. Yeah. So whoever is marginalized in our church, New Ways Ministry, I'm looking at you, um, women, um, uh, people, brown people, black people, non-European people, that is where we need to be looking if this organism is gonna come back to them. I just wanna add that uh I'm the only one in this room who was a bishop, as far as I know. <laughs> and I feel this tremendous responsibility to open the doors. I think so many of our bishops are trying to keep the doors shut. What are we afraid of? Yeah, so, so I'm not saying that I'm opening the doors to uh, a certain agenda. 
just have to open the doors to let people have meaningful decision-making capacity in our church. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Thank you.